voiceover. Hello and welcome to this comparison between the new M2 Pro MacBook Pro and the last great Intel i9 MacBook Pro from 2019. If you're in the market for a new MacBook and you're currently using an Intel MacBook, well, this video is for you. I'll go ahead right now and save you some time and tell you that for nearly everyone, just get the last generation M1 Pro in either 14 or 16 inch. But if you'd like to know why, keep watching. And we'll go over the design and build, performance features and software price and value of these two MacBook Pro models from my perspective as a professional software developer and new content creator. So let's start with the design and build of the new M2 Pro MacBook and the Intel Core 9 i9 MacBook Pro. The M2 Pro MacBook Pro comes in silver or space gray, which is really just a darker silver um, that feels more grown up than the 2015-2019 butterfly keyboard era MacBook space gray. Um, the Apple Silicon MacBooks bring the MagSafe connector back and now the Space Gray laptop comes with its own colour matched braided cable. It's nice, but the magnet is really quite strong, much stronger than the old MagSafe used to be. But I still wouldn't trust this to prevent a trip-induced MacBook Pro falling, crashing accident. Overall, the appearance is that it's a sleek, lightweight laptop. It's 1.6 kilos or 3.5 pounds in American versus the previous i9, which was a bit heavier at 1.95 kilos. It has a really minimalist design. In fact, it's so minimal it's even lost a Thunderbolt port. It now only has three of them, but it does gain a HDMI 2.1 port. The M1 Pro Max is HDMI 2 and the Intel Core i9 is nothing. <laughs> that can drive up to two external displays at up to 6K, 60 Hertz each, or one 8K display at 60 Hertz, or a 4K display at 240 Hertz. Now M2 Max can do much more, but this is more than sufficient for my needs. The 16 inch display has been improved quite a bit from its, ready for this, 3072 by 1920 and 80 resolution at 226 pixels per inch, to, uh, 500 nits brightness with a maximum refresh of 60 Hz, to 3456 by 2234 native resolution at 254 per pixels per inch. And whilst it can run in 500 nits in SDR mode, in HDR, Apple calls this XDR, it'll run at 1000 nits sustained and boost to 1600 nits. That's really, really bright. Apple also introduced ProMotion technology for an adapted refresh rates of up to 120 Hz. Other than this, it's a fantastic display that has one other thing. It's got that notch. Now a lot's been made about the notch when the M1 models were launched a couple of years ago with it. Now I will admit on the 14 inch version, the notch is more obvious, but it feels so much smaller on the 16 inch. When the M1s launched, software was still not mature and menu icons could be hidden behind the notch. And if the notch bothers you, you can hide it by blacking out the entire top row, thus making the bezel thicker in software. But it doesn't bother me any more than the notch on the iPhones did. The webcam is a similar 1080p FaceTime camera that we've seen in the older iPhones. It's an improvement on the 720p camera, but it doesn't have center stage or face ID. That said, it is a very thin display, so maybe there just wasn't sufficient space in the lid to mount an infrared dot projector there. But it does have Touch ID. And this is improved from the Intel MacBook Pro 2019 as Touch ID is built into the power button, which is around 50% bigger, and it's recessed now for a fingertip. No more touch bar, which I have mixed feelings about. It was great, the touch bar, but it just wasn't popular with users. Plus, as a developer, accessing function keys using the FN key wasn't the end of the world, but having no actual physical key meant I'd regularly hit the F6 shortcut to view code rather than F5 to build and run the solution. This isn't really a problem for me as I just use an external keyboard or the Apple Magic Keyboard, which still has the function keys. Now, since Apple already make different keyboard layouts, I wonder if they might have kept the touch bar as, a, as an option for some models. But this is Apple and they have a precedence for deleting hardware features that users are used to. But maybe this new Tim Cook Apple bringing back MagSafe and a proper laptop keyboard with reliable switches and function keys and the HDMI port, which has now come back. Maybe this is the way things will be for the future. I actually prefer this type of Apple. They even brought back the SD card slot. Be warned though, this SD card reader doesn't like old slow cards. Anything slower than UHS-1 will crawl. Now one can only expect a certain level of quality from small speakers, especially laptop ones. Now in 2019, the Intel MacBook Pro had the best sound that I'd ever heard from a laptop. Now in 2023, the 16 inch MacBook Pro 
has that title. It sounds deeper, richer, with clearer highs. Have a listen for yourself. Next, let's look at the performance of these two MacBook models. The M2 Pro MacBook comes with up to 64 gigabytes of RAM and up to eight terabytes of storage. Now, the Intel Core i9 MacBook Pro is known for its high performance, making it a great option for demanding tasks like video editing and graphic design, but it's also known for its loud fan and kind of overheating issues. Now, this thing gets hot pretty quickly and it's really quite noisy. In my previous videos, I've had to apply noise gate to some of my audio to knock out the fan noise. My experience with Apple Silicon is that it never seems to want to turn the fan on. It does get warm, not particularly hot, but the fan stays quiet if it is on at all. Okay, we kind of run Geekbench here on both machines and see how they do. Here are the results. We have the MacBook Pro 16 inch, late 2019, with a single core score of just over a thousand. And the Apple Silicon okay, is so double Okay, so the that. M2 Pro oh, wins right, then on the synthetic like benchmarks. And let's try score. something in the real world. So what we have here is my last YouTube short, uh, my video about solar panels and whether they work under snow or ice. Now, what we're gonna do is render both at exactly the same time and see how they do. That's pretty good for integrated graphics, I'm sure you will agree. Now we'll compare the integrated GPU of the M2 Pro with the discrete GPU of the i9. It's a Radeon 5500M. And you can see it's quite a bit better again. Let's do this together in real time. It's only a short. So here we go. You can see the progress of the render on the background tasks bar. So it looks pretty small in the video, I know, but here we go, let's see how we do. The M2 MacBook Pro in Space Gray is on the right, the Intel i9 is on the left. It's a 4K 10-bit clip in HVEC, or high efficiency codec. So we're gonna be testing that as well. I know Apple has introduced something that allows it to render HVEC. Oh, this is done. There we go, the M2 Pro is complete. And uh, we're still waiting on the i9. While we're waiting, why not do a crossword or a jigsaw or even better yet, why not just like, uh, subscribe if you're into this sort of content and leave a comment below on whether or not you would choose an M2 Pro over perhaps an M1 Pro and we're done. Time for a quick break with Gibson here and what have we learned? Well, clearly the Apple new M2 and M1 before it, silicon processes are incredible. But as a developer of 20 years writing code for Intel and Windows, can I move to Apple Silicon? Now we need to talk about RISC and CISC, or ARM and Intel. So what is the big deal between these two architectures? Why is it such a big deal that Apple's no longer using Intel? It was that we announced that we were going to shift to using Intel processors in Macs. <laughs> Why is it such a big deal that Apple's no longer using Intel? ARM RISC, or Reduced Instruction Set Computing, and Intel x86, x64, CISC, or Com Complex Instruction Set Computing, are both architectures used in microprocessors. Now, I'm just going to give you a nutshell here, and CISC, or Intel architecture, basically hard codes a large number of instructions onto the chip itself. 
That means RAM requirements are lower due to reduced code size. It also means that programmers or compilers have a much lower workload as the work is done in a large part on the CPU itself. But supporting these instructions on the register at chip level does require more transistors and therefore more power to run. And I know I said Intel architecture, but AMD also produced CISC chips used in Windows PCs too. You can think of it this way. ARM RISC processors are designed to use less power, making them ideal for battery powered devices like smartphones and tablets. Now, on the other hand, Intel x86, x64 processors are designed for more demanding tasks, such as running desktop and laptop computers. And as a result, they consume much more power. Now, Apple claims that you can still run software built for Intel on Mac OS with Apple Silicon using something they call Rosetta or Rosetta 2 now, which is named after that famous translation stone. This can apparently translate software compiled for Intel on the fly. That's really clever stuff, but the original Rosetta was notably not that good. Now, as a Microsoft technology stack developer, switching exclusively to Mac is half terrifying and half exciting. Apple's hardware, though expensive, was much more pleasant to use than the laptops churned out by Windows OEMs like Dell, whose plasticky bendy bodies and TN panel displays meant a constant struggle for a fit-for-purpose laptop typing experience or narrow viewing angles or poor color reproduction. Apple also had the best trackpads in the industry, and PC manufacturers for some reason just couldn't seem to make a decent trackpad. If you know why that is, please let me know in the comments. Now, a lot of my fellow developers would even install Windows and just wipe Mac OS completely off a MacBook Pro and just use it as a shell for Windows, a Windows PC with nicer hardware. Now, the main development environment that I use is Visual Studio. Prior to purchasing the M2 Pro, I was running Visual Studio in a virtual machine. Unfortunately, I cannot easily run Windows CISC virtual machines using Apple Silicon, as there might be a risk that Rosetta 2 would introduce issues or interfere at runtime somehow. Therefore, to code natively on the Mac for Windows, I have to use either Visual Studio for Mac or Visual Studio Code. No, they aren't the same and neither are as fully featured as Visual Studio for Windows. Visual Studio Code is essentially a lightweight text editor with the understanding of .NET programming language syntax. Visual Studio for Mac is usable and I have started to work on my first cross-platform projects with it using .NET 7. It does have GitHub Copilot, however, for new development, um, such that you would do on .NET, which is open source. Careful design and libraries can make software cross-platform. Nearly all my line of business applications are hosted on Azure and AWS. And for the rest, there's always a remote Windows VM or desktop PC. Future development won't be built on Windows exclusively, nor the outgoing .NET framework. Other tools like SQL Server Management Studio can be run using Docker, but I prefer dBeaver, who thinks of these names, or for database management. PowerShell can be installed easily using Homebrew. Microsoft has now been working towards a truly open source cross-platform experience with .NET and the .NET framework, much loved by business applications everywhere, ended active development in 2019. Since then, Microsoft has been focusing its laser efforts on the cross-platform framework simply called .NET. I'm presently migrating all my projects off the .NET framework and onto .NET. And since .NET is supported on the Mac, I should in theory be able to produce new projects entirely on an ARM Mac. So I don't feel that switching to ARM will be a big problem, but I suppose I'll find out. Worst case, I can just move to Windows Virtual Machine somewhere on Azure. Let's talk about the price and value of these two MacBook models. The M2 Pro MacBook starts at £2,149 for the 14-inch version and £2,699 for the 16-inch version. In true Apple style, you can spend much more. Don't buy the 512 gigabyte SSD, just don't do it. Not only is it too small in this day and age, it's significantly slower than even the M1. Go for one terabyte at least. I chose two terabytes with 32 gigabytes of RAM in the 16 inch model. The 16 inch model's base CPU, the M2 Pro, has actually two more cores than the 14 inch base model's M2 Pro. They're not exactly the same. When it comes to value for money, both MacBook Pro models offer great performance and features but choosing the 16 inch gives you much more of the beautiful display, much better battery life, a smaller apparent notch, better sound and in theory, better thermal management. But if a discounted M1 Pro or M1 Max is available, you'll get HDMI 2 rather than HDMI 2.1 and Wi-Fi 6 rather than Wi-Fi 6E. And of course, it's not the latest and greatest, but for the vast majority of people, this is the better buy. The M1 Pro still has the advantage over the Intel MacBook Pros, 
but the M2 is now cement that advantage. Thank you for watching this comparison between the last Intel MacBook Pro and the M2 Pro MacBook Pro. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and leave a comment with your thoughts on these two MacBook models. You're such a good